Would y'all mind standing this morning? Have you, are you glad you came to church so far? You at 50-50? Are you at 70, 70 30? Are you like 100%? All right, all right. <clears throat> it's a new season. Father, we decree. It's a new day. Oh, a fresh anointing is flowing my way. It's a season of power. And prosperity. Thank you, Jesus. It's a new season. It is coming to me. Now just lift your hands towards heaven. It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing. Oh, it's blowing my ray right now. Come on, prophesy. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. And I'm going to sing it again. Feels too good in here. Come on, lift both hands towards heaven. It's a new season. It's a new season. Thank you, Jesus. It's a new day. A fresh anointing. A fresh anointing right here, right now is coming my way. Oh, it's a season of power, Holy Ghost overcoming power and prosperity. Oh, it's a new season. Go ahead and prophesy. It's a new season. It's a new season. All things have passed away. All things are becoming new. It's a new season. Lack is over in Jesus' name. It's a new season. Sickness and disease is behind me. It's a new season. Grief and sorrow is gone. It's a new season. We believe it. It's a new season. And it's coming. To, who's it coming to this morning? Oh, it's coming to me. I prophesy. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand. A new season is coming to me in Jesus' name. I believe I receive. All of hell can't stop me because the blood of Jesus already paid for my victory on Calvary's tree. Hallelujah. That's something to shout about this morning. Amen. Praise God. Bro, you on fire this morning. I don't know if you know that. You're gonna, you'd be like, no, I'm sleepy. But no, you really are. <laughs> Give Johnny a big hand. Don't you appreciate him? Y'all may be seated this morning. I think you should uh, have it well in your mind what our theme is, thanks in large part to my son. Uh, I still, I'm not sure that he won't end up in acting or something. He can like, he's something. He's normally just his regular his position is kind of quiet, and, but boy, put him behind a camera, and he lights up and takes on different, you know, does voices, all kinds of stuff. Anyways, uh, I know they said it earlier, but I want to, uh, today, immediately following service is our Destiny Connection class. If you are not a member of this church and you want to be, we would love to have you hop in there this morning. Amen? We're a growing church in Jesus' name. And I like to say, you may want to date us, but we want to marry you. We like to be committed, right? <laughs> Two people like to be committed. That's good. Not many people want to be committed to much around here uh, in, in the world today, but at the fireplace, you want to be committed. Uh, we are marching with expectation. We are expecting good things from the Lord, not just in my life, in your life as a church. Amen. We are expecting from God. Uh, in light of that, I'll just take a side note and tell you that you've probably seen that the kids and I uh, recorded a new television show, and that is really as fruit from the Victory Gathering. I won't take you through all of that, but we kind of mustered up the courage to shoot a new television a series of shows with, um, of course, with Rob being in heaven. I would have never dreamed we would have pursued that. Oh, they have a slide. All right. So it's a trip family and friends now because we're going to have friends on every show. 
And it aired, it debuted, I think, last week on CTN. We have it on three Christian networks so far and talking to a few others that I believe we're going to get it on. And hallelujah. So I'm just saying that to say tonight, it, our first episode actually premieres on social media. So if you would be so kind to like it, or if you don't like it, please keep your comments to yourself. If you do like it, give it a little like. I will tell you, I, hope, I know they will get better. And when I tell you that, I probably shouldn't say it publicly, but literally not knowing what I'm doing, feeling my way, you have to understand Rob had been on television from the time he was about, 12 probably and new tv like the back of his hand and so to step out and do it uh without him and the first set of shows which is what is airing tonight i didn't even really know what we were naming it but i decided to name it now with the trip family which now of course means not over with in jesus name hallelujah But there's a lot of people in the world that the enemy has tried to make them think that their life is over with. But it is not. It is not. So, uh, so you'll notice we never say the word now (laughs) now in the show. (laughs) Because when we uh, taped these first ones, I didn't even have the direction. I kind of locked in a little bit better. But anyways, I've taken too much time on that. But I'd appreciate it if you would uh, like it or share it or whatever. And as they go, hopefully... Uh, they get a little bit more fine-tuned, but nobody will say that we are stuck in um, not willing to try and step out in faith. So we're, we're, we're going for it. Hallelujah. So I appreciate your prayers and that venture and your support. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Mark. Same. I'm going to start where we left off last week and actually revisit in a different way. Uh, last week was just March with Expectation. Today, I'm going to be talking about the crossroads of expectation and disappointment. I almost named it Living in Realville, but I decided I would be more dignified and name it the crossroad, <laughs> the crossroads of expectation and disappointment. I'm going to start in Mark uh, chapter 10, and I'm going to start with verse 46. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is my favorite part. Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. Can't you identify with that? But he only shouted louder. I love that. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Verse 50, Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see And Jesus said to him, go for your faith. Say faith. Your faith has healed you. Hallelujah. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing. And I thank you, Father, for a spirit of expectation hitting this church and hitting us, your people, like never before. To expect the impossible, to expect things that we've never seen before, to expect things that have been prophesied even decades ago. We're going to see it, and we expect it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. So expectation is actually what? Faith. It's actually faith. If I'm expecting something, I'm believing it's going to happen. I'm looking for it, right? A perfect example of expectation in a crowd would be all of us when the newsman, the weatherman, says that it's going to be stormy, what do you do? Or a better example would be in Florida or New Orleans when they're calling for a hurricane. What do we see? There won't be a cloud in the sky. There won't be a raindrop. And we see businesses boarding up their windows. We see sandbags all around their businesses, right? Why? 
because they are expecting what the weatherman said to come to pass. And yet the children of God, a man of God, a woman of God will say, thus saith the Lord, this is what's going to happen. And many Christians, not in this church, but they'll fold their arms and say, well, I believe it when I see it. We need to get to where we have more faith in the word of God than we have in a weatherman. Amen. We need to expect God's word to come true. I got several scriptures here. You can follow along or you can uh, just trust me that it's actually in the Bible. But we're going to go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 40. Very familiar. Uh, All of this is very familiar actually. But this is uh, the Lord had visited Mary, told her she was going to have a baby. Verse 40, uh, I'm going to actually start at verse 49. So this is Luke 1 and 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. Verse 41, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and explained uh, to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Now, y'all know, in case you don't, Elizabeth was expecting, by miraculous conception, John the Baptist. Y'all with me, right? So we just read here where Mary, now expecting Jesus, meets Elizabeth, who is expecting John the Baptist, and John the Baptist literally leaped in the womb of Elizabeth. Does that sound like expectation to you? All right, let's turn over here to John 1, 20 through 29. So that was uh, John the Baptist in the womb. And here we have John. I have all these marked, but when you have, you know, 20 million Bible markers, they all get confusing. Okay, John 1 and verse 20, let's see here, says... Uh, He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well, then, who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No, verse 22. Then who are you? This is John the Baptist. We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way, for the Lord is coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you aren't the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told him, I baptize you with water, but right here in the crowd, someone you do not recognize through his ministry, though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. This encounter took place in Bethlehem, an area east of Jordan River, where John was baptizing. The next day, uh, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Does that sound like expectation to anybody? So John was expecting the Messiah even in the womb. Then he's telling the Pharisees and all these people standing around, hey, there is a Messiah who's coming. And then he literally points him out and says, this is him. Behold the Lamb of God. Y'all with me? So we're talking about expectation. I have a, uh, I like to go back and forth in between science and the Bible and how the two back each other up. This is a study done in San Francisco Bay Area about a decade ago. The principal of the school called three teachers to inform them of an experiment that the district would be conducting. Because you are the finest teachers in the system, she said, we're going to give you 90 selected high IQ students. We're going to let you move these students through this next year at their pace and see how much they can learn. Y'all got it? The faculty and students were delighted. 
During the next year, they had a wonderful experience. By the end of the last semester, the students had achieved 20 to 30 percent more than any other group of students in the area. After the year was completed, the principal called in the teachers and told them, I have a confession to make. I have to confess that you did not have 90 of the most intellectual prominent students. They were run-of-the-mill students. We took 90 students at random from the system and gave them to you. The teachers were pleased. Wow. If the students were only average, that shows that the teachers had displayed an exceptional skill and expertise. Y'all get it? They're like, oh, well, if they weren't super smart, then it's just because we're such wonderful teachers. And the principal says, well, I have one more thing to tell you. Y'all's names were the first three that we drew out of a hat. There's nothing special about your teaching. How about that? Uh, If the students and the teachers had been picked at random, then what had enabled them to make greater progress than any other group in the system? It was the expectation of all the people involved because the teachers and the students expected to succeed. Can I tell you it's important that you tell your children they're smart? You're going to do great. You're wonderful. You are a blessing to everyone you meet who gets to meet you. We need to expect the best out of every relationship that we have. It just burns me up, and I've heard it so many times where a a person will be talking to their child, oh, you're just like your father. And, of course, the father, they're divorced or whatever, right? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, you're just like your mother. Your mother's just such a da-da-da-da-da-da, and here you are. No, 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 no. We need to expect the best. We don't need to belittle. We don't need to put down. We need to let that we are expecting the highest and best from every situation in Jesus' name. All right, so expectation is important, right? So turn with me over to Matthew, and I promise you I'm getting somewhere. Matthew 11 and 2 through 6, and this is my final portion of Scripture uh, for this this time. i got a few more here at the end. Matthew 11, John the Baptist, who was in prison, say prison, had about all the th- heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, Go back and tell John. Tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear. The dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. So here is my point, Saint. Last week I did uh, on the text of Blind Bartimaeus, and I'm going to go back to that in just a moment. And it was very uh, exciting, and we're supposed to be expecting and get our faith up, which is what this whole month is about. But I was... I would do you an injustice if I did not stop and talk about disappointment. John the Baptist, I just showed you through the word where in the womb he leaked because he recognized the Messiah. Right? We agree on that? Then... He is there when he's going to baptize Jesus. He's the one, he is the one who pointed him out. Nobody knew who Jesus was, how great he was, but it was John the Baptist like, hey, we got a guy here who is the Messiah. But then you fast forward and problems came. John the Baptist ends up in prison, and now in his discouragement, He is saying, hey, 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 I need disciples, come here. Will you go ask him, is he really the one? Or should we look for another? Because it does not match my theology. If he is really the one, then what am I doing setting in 
prison. That has to be. Why would he send the disciples to go looking and asking when he knew from his, before he came out in the world, in his mother's womb, he already knew. But his discouragement changed his perception. His disappointment changed his point of view. And that's why I was going to name this sermon Living in Realville. Does anybody get what I'm talking about? So this morning, I want to discuss the fact that uh, going back to the original text, and it's a great point that Blind Bar made us in Mark chapter 11. There you go. Keep it on there. Going down a couple more. Uh, it's in Mark 11. I believe it's verse 49. But Blind Bar to Manus, they try to get him shut up, so he only cries louder, right? And he says, hey, hey, bro, your lucky day. He's calling for you. And he took off, right? We talked about it last week. He took off the coat that was his label of poverty and being lame. Hallelujah. He, he took off in expectation before he was even healed. He took off the old man, you could say. Well, as I was pondering all of this this week, and I got other stories, other, uh, other texts ready to roll about expectation, how we got to believe God, but the Spirit of the Lord ministered to me. That the believer, I believe the unsaved, in fact, I have seen it so many times. The unsaved will get a miracle so fast. They'll get saved and get a miracle instantly. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They get saved, they get a job. Their wife comes back. Their kids are all of a sudden great. They get a bonus. Y'all know what I mean. And Joe Blow over here that's been serving God your whole life, you're like, uh, hello, God. Uh, you know, I've been a faithful tither. Where's my bonus? Am I the only one? And the Lord showed me that this children of God, we have allowed ourselves to be disappointed, and that becomes a garment that we wear that no one can see, but we're wearing it. Years ago, when I went through a lot of depression, a lot of stuff in my early, late teens and early 20s, I was, you know, insane to even think this. But I remember thinking, oh, this person's in a wheelchair, and this person has a cast, and this person is so evident. They're in a walker, and I'm sitting in here, and I'm as wounded as them, and I'm in as much pain as them, and no one can see. They get all the attention because everyone knows they're in a wheelchair. Kind of like I wish I could, you know, show my wounds. Let me tell you. I've lived long enough now to know, because <laughs> I, I, I now have it the other way. I'm glad everybody can't see the wounds that I have endured. I'm glad everyone doesn't see the cast. I'm, I'm glad. But with that, we have to give it to Jesus. So, Brother Mark, up here sitting here on the front row, bro. You maybe you shouldn't have done that. I'm going to use you if you don't mind. Come on up here. Y'all give Mark a hand. He's a good young man. All right, so we're going to strap this backpack on you, bro. And it just happens to be sparkly. Thank you, Jacqueline. Let me unzip it. All right, there you go. Get it on. So he's a Christian, okay? Yeah, it's like a kindergartner's backpack, I think. So it may be an issue, but. <laughs> All right, so he, he's Mr. Christian. He ties, he gives. I don't know what this weighs. It's a pretty good amount. And uh, he's praying for, to get this a new job. And the guy that don't even go to church or ever give, he got it. You didn't. And you're just supposed to keep on believing God for the next thing. Then, those of you, he's not married, but you're married. Things get rocky. You're standing and believing for a restoration of your marriage. And he leaves anyway. Anybody know about that? Then you keep on believing God, and he's still gone. <laughs> then, you know, uh, I'll just say this is a disappointment to me. Uh, the first lady, I don't know if you know, caught it, but the first lady gave, uh, for the first time ever, a biological man the Woman of Courage Award in America 
and we've prayed, we've fasted, we stand. We're Second Chronicles two twenty, uh, twenty. We're decreeing, and our country, yeah, getting a little heavy. Just said, yeah. I could go around this room and tell you of disappointment upon disappointment upon disappointment. I don't think she'd mind me saying, but dear sweet Linda over here, her precious son, Reno, he was perfectly normal till he was 11 years old. Doctor malpractice is what put him in a wheelchair. You want to talk about disappointment? Me as his pastor and my husband, we have prayed and prayed and commanded, and uh, speaking of Reno specifically, believing God for him to come out of that wheelchair. We've been in healing services. We've had miraculous things happen. We go pray for him. And she still wheeled him out in that wheelchair every time so far. But here's what the enemy tries to do to us. Who you think you are praying for somebody in a wheelchair? Then, do I need to talk about those we love that we stood by their bedside and prayed for them to live and not die? Decreed the word of the Lord. Quoting scripture, doing exactly what Jesus said do. Being in right standing with God. And uh, they die. And oh, by the way, the drug addict, the cricket preacher, uh, I can go down the list. The dirty lawyer, the this, the the dirty politicians, they're all alive and well and kicking. And the one, the holy saint of God who lived in righteousness, uh, we buried him. Woo! Now I know why she had it just there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to locate this. Okay. You can step out here with me. Yeah. Yep. All right. So, Mark, I want you to put the. So, here's what we do. This, you don't have to put it on. This is what the Lord showed me. Bartimaeus was lame and blind and poverty stricken. But those of us who have been in the faith, raised in church, maybe, maybe you've been saved for, maybe you've been saved for five years. Maybe, maybe you've only been saved a year. But there is disappointments that come. And then we're walking around all weighted. Come on, we're going to walk. We're all weighted, but nobody can see it. But we're so weighted down by all the times that we've prayed, and we believe it didn't come out like we thought it should. Because most of the time, really most of our prayers are, God, please come down in my situation and do the things the way I think they should be done and let them come out the way I think they should come out. That's 99%, I believe, of a lot of our prayers. And then when they don't happen like we wanted them to happen, how we think they should happen in the time frame they should happen, Instead of, now we're not saying we don't believe in God. That's what I'm wanting you to understand. We're not saying we're not turning into atheists. We're not saying we don't believe in God, but we're carrying the weight of disappointment. And this weight, yeah, this weight becomes a veil in between our faith and receiving. And that is why most of the church is not seeing miracles today as we should because we're walking around with with all of this weight of disappointment and things that didn't go the way we thought they should. And oh, by the way, Americans are very spoiled. I can take you to foreign countries today where they walk through a war with a baby on their hip, with no shoes, with no bicycle, and they went to the house of the Lord because they knew that's where their peace and their healing and their joy is. But in America, if it's too hot, too cold, don't have good air, don't have good pews, if the time is not just right, we, ha- we lost an hour of sleep. Oh, we can't come to church. We are disappointed. Because things didn't go like we thought they should. So the Spirit of God is saying to us, you are going to have to lay aside the weight. You're going to have to make a decision. Let me come back over here. So stay here with me, brother. And I just want to point out that I'm not, we're not, we're not the only people who's ever thought this way. I just hit on the American church, but... Uh, in 1 Kings 19, 
The prophet Elijah, y'all know who I'm talking about, I refer to it Wednesday night. He had been on Mount Carmel. He called fire down from heaven. He had a show off with the prophets of Baal. And he's the one who won, by the way. And in just a couple chapters ahead, he is a few chapters further, he is running from Jezebel, who's saying she's going to kill him. And he is begging God to let him die. We are the church who have all power over the devil. We are the only ones who can make a difference in the world. And yet we sit wrapped in our coat of disappointment and it keeps our faith from activating. The prophet Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, Though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Here it is. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on high hills. Hallelujah. You're going to have to make a decision. James 3, I'm not going to take the time, but it says very specifically, the mouth is the udder. The mouth, your tongue, is the udder. It is the one that steers the ship. You better watch in these seasons of disappointments, and I'm not going to lie, we all go through them. Let's be honest. And I'm not saying be negative, you know, no one wants to meet that. How are you doing, sister? Oh, I'm horrible. God ain't answered my prayers. You know, no one wants to hear that, right? But we do fall into this false illusion. How you doing? Oh, I am great. Praise God. Got my Jesus pin. Got my bumper sticker. Somewhere in there, we have to bring God the authentic need of our heart, which is I'm hurting because things didn't go the way I thought they should. I'm struggling in my faith. But instead, so many times, we're not honest with God. And we just are wrapped in this garment. This In Psalms, it's called the garment of heaviness. So your mouth is the, what makes the uh, ship go whatever way it's going to go. So you better watch what you say. Turn to your neighbor and say, you better watch what you say. <laughs> Doesn't mean you won't think it. But you got to take authority over it and not let it guide your ship. Do you understand what I mean? And you're going to have to make a decision. And can I tell you, I know of what I speak. You are going to have to make a decision. But here's the problem. You're going to have to make a decision if you ever want to receive anything else from the Lord. You're going to have to make a conscious decision. I'm letting this go. I'm not going to carry this around and I'm not going to walk in it. And I'm not going to be heavy with it. I release it as unto the Lord. And I trust you, God. Those three words, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Jesus. My trust is in you. I have no other hope but you. Here's someone else who's felt the same way we did. The psalmist David, Psalms 27, 13. I would have lost heart. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hallelujah. John 8, 31 through 32. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue, say continue. If ye continue in my word. Then ye are my disciples. Can I tell you that a lot of people get stuck right here. They get saved. Oh, yeah, and they'll still say they believe in God. And everyone wants their hell insurance. No one wants to go to hell. But do they go any further than this? No. Something happens. Maybe they put their faith out there to believe God for something impossible. Maybe they join their faith with someone else. And it didn't happen the way they thought it should happen. So instead of making a choice... That I'm going to let this go and just trust God that he's going to turn everything for my good. Trust God that we are not, we walk in the anointing, not in manipulation. That is witchcraft. We cannot control anybody. If you're believing God for your marriage and he still leaves, we can't control another man's will. 
Me and my husband are as one as one could be. And when it came down to it, it was his decision if he was going to go be with the Lord or not. And that is something that I have to just release and let go and realize that Bible is true for me. It's true for you. It's true for him. It's true for them. The Bible's true. And I just have to accept it. But, oh, how I would love to tell God how to do things. Can I get a witness? Oh, y'all acting out holy like you're not like that. But it's the truth. Now, God. So, but here's what we're going to do at the Fireplace Fellowship. We're going to exchange our garment of heaviness for the spirit of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And this veil in between our faith, we're taking that thing off. And then we're going to do what he said, Paul said to do in Hebrews 1 through 3. Go ahead and take off your backpack. I'm going to lay aside the weight that doth so easily beset me because I have a race to run. And I'm going to run it in Jesus' name. He can't even take it off by himself. There you go. That's why the Bible says, let us lay aside the weight. You need, that's great. You need somebody to help you. That's why you need to be connected to the body of Christ to get you out of the mess you're in, out of the muck of hell and shame and guilt. Hallelujah. We need each other. We are the body of Christ, jointly fit together. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I got one more point for you. Mr. Piano Man can come back if you don't mind. Hopefully this is a shorty but a goodie, okay? We got uh, 1 John. Let me see here. If I was telling God what to do, my eyes being 2020 would be a whole lot more convenient. Like, Lord, you want me to be a speaker? It should be nice if I could read my notes without my glasses. Ah. <sighs> This whole, you know, gravity, age, you know. <laughs> he won't let me bypass that for some reason. First John 3, 2. Are you ready? Last point. The devil doesn't care what you've done in your past. He don't care if you're a drug addict, if you, what you've been doing. He, he, of course, he's always going to try to beat you over the head with guilt and shame. But the enemy is fighting you because of your future. He is, he is tormented by if you actually... Get a hold of the Word of God and actually become what God has called you to be. The first John, uh, one, first John 3, 2. Beloved, talking about you. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is i am becoming like jesus day by day hour by hour as i pursue him i am becoming like jesus which means i can walk on serpents i can drink any deadly thing and it won't harm me i cannot be stopped by the devil because i have all power over the enemy do you remember when jesus said the prince of this world cometh but he hath nothing in me some of us are bound up by straight jackets of depression and unbelief and discouragement, and we wonder why we don't see our prayers answered. Scientific, another scientific fact for you. Before your mind goes into depression, discouragement, or disappointment, the first thing it will always feel is fear. Which takes me back to Joshua 1 and 8 and 9. Be strong. It says, do not fear. Be strong and courageous. Because if you get into fear, then the discouragement will shut you down before you ever get out the door. Fear of what's going to happen. Fear of how can I make it. Fear, how will I ever live without that person. Fear of provision. And then here comes the discouragement. And now we're wrapped in a shroud of disappointment, discouragement, and shame. And I'm talking about the people who attend church. You understand? This is for you, saints of God. This morning, I want you to take an inventory of yourself. Take an inventory of your life. Can you go back to that one thing that you've prayed for, and it didn't happen, 
And now, you probably wouldn't admit it before today's message, but there's just that, uh, just that hesitation to really do what Bartimaeus did and just take off that coat and run to Jesus. This morning, I'm going to ask you to immature your own life. By the Holy Spirit, through the, through the uh, light of His Word, He will go back through the, ca- uh, the ca- uh, parts of your heart, all the dark spaces, and He'll shine the light of truth. And He'll take you back to that thing or that place where the disappointment came in. Maybe it was how somebody treated you. It could have been in your childhood. It could have been you never should have been raised that way. You never should have been talked to that way. Maybe you've carried the guilt and the shame of past failures. But something, even though you have confessed Jesus as Lord, there is something that has kept you bound up and kept you from really receiving what God has for you. I'm telling you that what God is doing in this church, what God is doing in the city, what God is doing in America, we need every child of God fully activated. We don't need you bound up. We don't need you in depression. We don't need you being all oh, high on Him and confessing your scriptures on Facebook on one day and the next day asking God to let you die. We need people who are steady. We need people who are, will look at the mountain and say, Mountain, you may think you're bigger than me and you're stronger than me, but I'm telling you the word of God is in my mouth and I'm a believer and I do not doubt. And I'm telling you in Jesus' name, you must be cast into the sea. One of us is moving and I'm not going anywhere in Jesus' name. And I'm here to tell you, I prayed for Reno once, I prayed for him twice, but I'm going to keep on praying for him until we see the miraculous happen. I will not be stopped by disappointment. I will not be stopped by fear in the name of Jesus. Just being totally honest because that's what I want you to do. In the last 14 months, I've had a few of those conversations with God myself. There was two times in my early 20s that I, before I ever met Rob, that I should have died in Haiti two times in a riot, two different riots in Haiti, a.k.a. insane. But um, why I ever went back, that's a whole other thing. But I can remember asking the Lord, Why? Didn't you just let me go? Why wasn't I taken out in the riots in Haiti? I'm just, I'm just being, just showing you how I really think. Because, you know, it would have been like a hero's death. She's a missionary. All of that great stuff. What a cool story, right? I didn't have any children. And I can remember flying many times over country, overseas and thinking, I really... I don't have anybody I care about at home. Of course, my parents, but no one I'm responsible for. So, hey, let's just go. Yeah, sign me up. Get, put me in a car with a Haitian and a chicken and a bunch of toys, and here we go. I asked the Lord, why? Well, I know my parents were so faithful, and my parents should have never buried their daughter, their baby girl. And then I go to, but I'm supposed to bury the one I love. My children had to bury their father as a teenager. That doesn't make sense. Rob was married before I, before he ever met me. He could have had more children. They could have stayed together. I have this whole story worked out in my head. But for some reason, and when I come into this house of worship, and I see people here praising God, I see miracles like we have in Brother Randy sitting up here on the front row cancer-free this morning after a stage four cancer diagnosis. Miss Jacqueline over here, if you knew what God had done in Chuck and Jacqueline's life, then I say to myself, I'm going to let go of this disappointment. I'm going to trust that God had a plan and he knew what he was doing even though it don't fit my plan it doesn't fit my plan but if I'm going to live I'm going to have to make
make a decision, which I have. I have made the decision. I'm going to live. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to be full of faith. I'm going to trust God with reckless abandonment. I'm going to do what he's called me to do. And I will not let the weight of the disappointment keep me from receiving from God. As Chuck said, I already quoted him a few times. He said, if someone would have told me a year and a half ago I was going to a church that had a woman pastor, I would have never believed it. And I said, Chuck, me too. (laughs) This was not my plan. But I'm surrendered to the plan of God. (laughs) Whatever he says do, I will do. And I'm not going to stay bound up in fear and in disappointment. Because do you see how the enemy, what, what a great second plan he has. He don't take you out in death, but he just keeps you living a miserable life. If you really don't believe God for anything, then you'll never receive anything. And then you'll just stay just like the children of Israel for 40 years going around the same mountain. And we all know they died not getting into the promised land except for Joshua. Is there anybody in the Joshua generation in this house this morning? Go ahead and stand to your feet. Joshua was able to to leave the disappointment of never entering in those first 40 years. Of burying Moses. Technically, he didn't bury him, but seeing him be gone. And he was still able to enter in. I'm asking you this morning, are you able to believe God for the impossible? There are things some of you have asked for and prayed for, and the answer did not come. And you know what you've done? You've put it on the shelf. And you've said to yourself, well, God just must not have that from me, so I'm just putting that right there. And God, if you want to surprise me, have at it, but I'm not going to ask you for it or believe for it again. And the Spirit of the Lord is saying, ask. The Spirit of the Lord is saying, don't be stopped by disappointment. The Spirit of the Lord is saying, Fireplace Fellowship, it's time for you to get the reckless abandonment and the boldness of Bartimaeus. And in an instant, in a moment, everything changed. He went from handicapped and lame and blind and poor to being the man that Jesus had just stopped, given his attention to, and healed. Hallelujah. That's me in Jesus' name. So this morning, I ask you to inventory your own life, Father, in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord God, to show us, Father, those things that we have laid to the side. Those things that we have allowed the enemy to cheat us out of. He has managed to get us to deactivate our faith, to stop expecting you for the impossible. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So he's got us in this impossible situation, just sustaining and enduring life. And we are called to have an abundant life and life more abundantly. Some of you are saying, I raised my children the way they were supposed to be raised. And oh, the disappointment. And the Spirit of God is saying, trust me. The Spirit of God is saying, give it to me again. The Spirit of God is saying, don't allow yourself to be wrapped up in disappointment. You boldly decree, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. If that's you this morning, I'm going to just ask you to calm down and fill up these altars in Jesus' name. Just as a sign of surrender. Father, we are laying aside our coat this morning. We are giving up our coat of disappointment. Saints, this is a serious, this is a serious altar call this morning. This is a serious time. This may be the difference of you being instantly made whole. This may be the difference of you being instantly healed, of your children being instantly set free. You getting honest with the fact that you have walked in disappointment. These altars are open. The Lord's already told me. If you want to stay in your in your religious oh, everything's fine, then you can stay in your seat. But if you're really ready to lay aside the weight, whatever it is, these altars are open for you this morning. 
And just like blind Bartimaeus, there's a supernatural touch of your faith to be made whole in this house. Can I get all the staff to go ahead and come down and begin to receive people? Come on, the elders, come on down. Line the front here. This is probably one of the most important altar calls we've ever had in this church. Because we're about to be activated into the miraculous. He's taking you back to that thing. He's taking you back to that hurt. He's taking you back to that place. You prayed for it. You asked for things to go this way, and it went that way. And you've just kind of pulled a shade over it. But the Spirit of God is saying, give it to me. You need to be bold enough and say, I'm not going to let my disappointment keep me from expectation. In the name of Jesus. I call for signs and wonders and miracles in Jesus' name. I call for the miraculous. I call for joy to spring up in the hearts of your people. I pray for faith to rise in the name of Jesus. I pray for mountain-moving faith in the name of Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for these people who are being honest this morning. I thank you, Lord God, for these people. God, there's no shame in it. In fact, there's great joy in it because they're leading the way for the other saints to be set free. Hallelujah. Oh, Rebbe, Shiko, Rabba, Shanda, Rabba, Sunday. We break the generational curses of fear and doubt and discouragement in Jesus' name. I pray the strength over your people to break generational curses. I pray the strength over your people to do and be what God has called them to be in the name of Jesus. We break the spirit of disappointment. We break it in Jesus' name. Oh, God is doing a deep work in this house this morning. Oh, Rabba Shanda Rabba Sanda Riyasi. Hey, oh, Rabba Shanda Rabba Sanda. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the heavens are open over this house this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you're pouring out a blessing that we cannot contain because we are touching you with our faith. We are touching you with our faith. Oh, Rabba Shanda Rabba Sanda. If you are not saved in this house this morning, or maybe you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, maybe it's been a long time, I encourage you, right in your seat, if you want to come forward, you can. You just, all you got to do is say, Father, I repent of my sin. Father, I want to come back. I want to come back home. I'm tired of where I've been living. I'm tired of the sin. I'm tired of the guilt. Oh, And Father, I believe you are the Son of God. For those of you watching online, if you're dealing with disappointment, we agree with you this morning that your faith will be made whole in Jesus' name. You're taking off the shroud of discouragement and heaviness has got to go. That straight jacket of depression has got to go in Jesus' name. Oh, Rabba Shandai. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just continue to pray. Just continue to. Oh, hallelujah. I felt this song rolling over in my spirit. Just receive it as a prophetic word. You may be down. And feel like God has somehow forgotten. Y'all know it. That you are faced with circumstances you can't get through. (laughs) Oh, I've been there. And right now it seems that there's no way out. And you're going under. But God's proven time. And time again, he'll take care of you, and he'll do it again for you. 
He'll do it again. Hallelujah. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. Where's my singers? Come on, help me. You may not know how. You may not know when. But he'll do it again. Come on, lift your hands if that's for you. Second verse. God knows the things that you're going through. And he knows how you're hurting. You see, he knows just how your heart has been broken in two. Come on, sing. But he's the God of the sun, the moon, and the sea. Hallelujah. And he is your father. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands if you receive that. And he'll calm the storm, and he'll find a way to fix this for you. Come on and sing, Kim. Come on, sing. He'll do it again for you. He'll do it again. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same God as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. Let's sing that chorus one more time. He'll do it again for you. He'll do it again. Hallelujah. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same God as then. You may not know how. You may but he'll do it again. Come on, give the Lord some praise. You may not know how. You may not know how. You may not know when. But he'll do it again. Oh, he's doing it again. Hallelujah. He's doing it again. We're like Habakkuk. We say, yet I will praise the Lord. Yet I will joy in the Lord of my salvation. Hallelujah. When you feel that discouragement, when you feel that depression, just lift your hands and say, oh, I know he's going to do it again. Just like Daniel. <laughs> just like Joshua. Just like Moses. He's going to do it for me. Come on, just put your hand on your heart and decree. He's doing it for me in Jesus' name. We stretch our hands of faith towards Reno. And we say, Reno, you shall walk and you shall talk in the name of Jesus. Ha, <laughs> Devil, we will not give up. We will not give up. You shall live and not die in Jesus' name. Harabashando. Saints of God, there's a heavy anointing in this house. We've already come down. But if you feel like you're in a wheelchair this morning, spiritually speaking, if you need a miracle, I want to pray for you this morning. I just felt that in my spirit. Maybe you were me all those years ago. I was so broken. I was so hurting. And nobody had a clue. But I'm here to tell you this morning, he's the same God. And nothing is too difficult for him. Oh, we trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We don't know how. We don't have to know how. 
We don't have to know when. We just trust that you're doing it. Hallelujah. We trust that you are an on-time God. Hallelujah. Oh, Do you think the three Hebrew children, when they took their bold stand of faith, actually wanted to go through the fire? Of course not. They were doing a standoff. They were like, oh, no, our God will, you know. And in the fire they go. But the heart of the king was turned because he witnessed the greatest miracle of the fourth man in the fire. Hallelujah. I cannot tell you people from across America, in fact, other countries far and wide, will inbox me or text and say, your church is such an inspiration. Because they're watching us from outside the fire and they see the fourth man in here with us. When sometimes we haven't even seen him ourselves, But they seem. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, every person in this room, every person watching online, we decree the word of the Lord. We decree the hope of the Lord. We decree the strength of the Lord. And I prophesy, get ready for miracles like you've never seen. You've questioned and you've been so discouraged. You have been carrying around the garment of heaviness. And as you remove that heavy yoke off of yourself through worship and praise and faith, you shall see the miracle that you have been believing for. I decree it and I say it is so in Jesus' name. If that's for you, just praise God this morning. Glory to God. I hope you go home singing that. He'll do it again. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you, Lord, that others are going to see the miraculous because of this nucleus of believers that determined we will not give up. And, Father God, as you have shown us step by step where we've erred, we're like, oh, no, we, we believe in God. He's showing us, no, we need to deal with this over here. We need to get out of discouragement. We need to get out of the depression and get into praise. I decree that over every person in this house, and I thank you, Lord, for it. And, Father, check us in the spirit, God, if we begin to fall into that. Check us in the spirit. In Jesus' name. And, Father, we say thank you for miracles. Thank you for the miraculous. Father, I hear the phone ringing from somebody's son coming home, Father. I hear the phone ringing, God, relationships being restored. In Jesus, in Jesus' name, he'll do it again, saints. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Praise God. I hope to see you this Wednesday night. Pastor Chris, I believe, is coming. You need a different microphone. I'm taking this one with me. Y'all, we got the best staff at this church. Would you give our, our staff, and uh, I'm telling you, they're tough. Woo. They're not weak people. You're blessed because of it. Hallelujah. I love you. I hope you're staying for the burrito. Donuts and burritos. Come on. That's a pretty good deal right there.